Okay. Shall we, shall we begin with the Fatiha? Yes, would you like to do that? We'd be great. Audu Bilahi Manash Shaitani Arajim, Bismillah Arachman Arahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Arachman Arahim, Maliki Yomidin, Yaka Nabudu Ayaka Nastain, Ihdina Sarat Al Mustakim. Surat al-Lazina namta alayhim, Khairu matubi alayhim, Wala So welcome, beloveds, to a class about the Hajj. It's coming right before the week of the Hajj. And um, I've invited Sama and Nu because they went on Hajj, and I think it sounds like something so impossible and far away and undoable that I invited them to come and talk about some of the nitty gritty and some of the most amazing experiences and whatever they wanted to, but to give us a feeling that yes, it's real and yes, we can do it. Before I do that, I want to tell a story of my own that's not about them. And that's that I spent about 12 years doing, going in and out of Egypt doing research. And we were in a rural area. And so one of the first things I noticed was these, they had kind of mud terracotta houses. And some houses had these elaborate designs on them with camels and with a picture of the Kaaba and all sorts of things. And I was like, what are these? And people said, well, when someone goes on the Hajj and they come back, they paint their entire journey on the side of their house. Wow. And the community is so proud to have one person who went on the Hajj that they celebrate. So whole communities raise the money that it took for that person to go. If that person was head of a household, they would be historically maybe gone maybe a year in recent times, gone three to four months. And so the community would also support the family while the head of household was gone. I say that because down the road at some point, it's my dream that our community could start helping our beloveds go on Hodge because that's what communities do. When I started working in Egypt, I was working with the director of the Nutrition Institute and it turns out that she was a Haga. She had been on the Hajj. And everybody that I met, and she had been on Umrah twice and the Hajj once, everybody that I met told me what a holy woman she was. Everyone described to me how big her heart was. At the time, I had no idea what Sufism was. But as I look back on all the things people told me about her, I wouldn't be surprised to learn that she was a Sufi. So my whole introduction to Islam was from the outside. It was as an outsider moving around in it. And I learned a lot about it, but I didn't learn any of the inner. So with great pleasure and excitement. <laughs> I introduce to you Sama and New Ross. Um, there's been a, a little introduction that happened beforehand, but I think we'll just start from Hodge. And my first question is, aside from CD <laughs> um, and his uh, influence over you, how did you come to, what, what drove you to go on the Hodge and how did it all get started? I want to read that first or should I let I will answer that question if we thought about this and it's a really nice story but Sama found a passage in one of CD's books which book was it I'll, I'll introduce it so um I wanted to start and we do want to answer that question it's a really important question that you ask Rahima if you will be patient with us 
we're, we're going to insert it on the journey, if that's okay. <laughs> so this book, if you don't have it, it's really, really beautiful. You can't read it that well because it's backwards, but Walking the Path of Su Sufism. It's one of the latest books that came out, uh, written by C.D., Walking the Path of Sufism. And on page 236, he writes about the pilgrimage. The pilgrim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, the pilgrimage has a station above which there is no other station. Because of this, there is no way to speak about its hidden meaning and reality. There are no words that can help us to express exactly what it is and no letters which could make up the words which would be able to convey the truth of its meaning. For this reason, there are very few of the folk as a rule who speak about it and very few of those who have reached it because of their lack of ability to do so. Yet, the pilgrimage is for whoever can make his way to it, her way to it, and is a duty for every Muslim to perform once in his or her lifetime. So Sidi tells us there are no words, and yet we're gathered here tonight to talk about it. So we introduce that paragraph to you um, to alert you, warn you, may, perhaps, that our words will be insufficient. We're going to do our best to talk about the outer Hajj, which is what most people ask about. What was it like? What do you do? How do you prepare for it? How are you called? That's the outer Hajj. The inner Hajj is really difficult to talk about because it is transformative. And it is, you're in such intimacy with Allah, which all of you have experience those intimate moments with Allah and if someone asked you about them you would probably be at a loss of words so that is the Hajj experience it is um and and plus you're going through this experience but you cannot analyze and and put words to it as you are going through it and even when you get back home and you reflect on it the words are insufficient so that's our caveat this evening. And are you please, if we say anything you disagree with or you would like to embellish, we invite you to join the discussion. No, you're doing fine. Continue. So how do we talk about the unspeakable? We're, I, I, we, Sama and I talked about this in preparing for tonight and we believe we can give you at least a little flavor of the inner as well as some of the, a lot of the outer, but uh, we wanted to start from the fact that we will not be able to capture it all. So, um, how did we get on Hajj? Well, I mean, if if you've taken hand with CD, if you've become a Muslim, you're familiar with the five pillars of Islam, and of course, one of those pillars, no, number five in CD's book on page on the music of the soul on page twenty nine is al Hajj, the pilgrimage. So Sama and I were certainly aware of that. And oh yeah, someday maybe we'll go, we get to go on Hajj and that'll be fine. Sufi school, Sufi school East, Pharma Peace. I believe it was 2015, but I'm not 100% sure. It could have been 14, but it probably was 15. 15. What I want to say is it's, it's absolutely fine for all of us who are Muslim to have the intention that we want to go on Hajj someday and maybe even start planning and saving and uh, preparing ourselves to do that. We had not gotten to that point. But in, in, in the Hawa at Sufi School East, I believe 2015, I got a download. Um, I can't remember whether CD was there or, or not, but his spirit was certainly there. And I got this download that said, you guys should go on Hajj. <laughs> and I told Sama and she said, what? <laughs> we had not talked about it in real terms. It was hypothetical. It was one of those things that maybe we talked about 
seriously once every three years. That's how frequently, infrequently we spoke about so it. I wanted to tell this story because what I wanted to encourage everyone who has not yet been on Hajj is, you know, okay, go ahead and plan if you if you have the intention, but also be alert for those downloads, be alert for the guidance that says now is the time for you to do the pilgrimage. And so naturally, and during the Hawa at Sufi School East, Saman, I grabbed Salima and talked to her and she thought that was a great idea. She, had, she and some other people from our community had been on Hajj. And we sat in our hearts and said, okay, when are we gonna do this? And we both got, we all got 2017. Hmm, that's a couple of years from now. So long story short, we said, okay, fine, that's fine. Didn't do a whole lot of conscious thinking planning. When it got to be 2017, approaching time to think about signing up for Hajj, all the, all the resources, all of the circumstances that would allow us to do it just fell into place. We had, we had built up money that allowed us to uh, book a, a very nice tour group that, that work schedules allowed it. Uh, it, was, it, it was the first miracle. Well, I don't know how many miracles, but the, the download came, the guidance came, and just as we got in our hearts, 2017, we were ready to go. So we started doing all of the outer things that you have to do to go on Hajj. So um, I just, with Rahima put in the announcement for tonight, um, some of the things that Sidi wrote about Al Hajj and as the pillar, one of the pillars of Islam, I would like to just remind people that Sidi talks about the light that comes through on the pilgrimage and the, that it's at the foundation of it all is the love. And I'll just do a plug for Ibrahim and Salima and Kamala uh, Shenman's uh, Hajj retreat that's coming up very soon where they are talking about bringing in the light of the Hajj. So that, that's, how we, that's how we got there. And let's take a pause right now because some of you might be, have really practical questions about how do you sign up for that? How much does it cost? What is the procedure? If, you, if you're not interested in all that, we're not gonna talk about it. But if you do have questions, raise your hand, put it in the chat, we'll stop and, and uh, address those, those issues. Cause that, that was one of the big questions I, I had before we started. So what is this Hajj? How do you get go on Hajj? No so I would say, why don't you give it from a sort of, you know, high level? And then if people have questions to drill down, then they, sure. they'll they know what they can ask questions about in a way. So just kind of step yeah. in. So um, you go online and you research Hajj companies. You have to go with a company. You can't go by yourself. Uh, women have to be escorted, accompanied by a man. It could be any man, it could be a relative. It could be it has a to be the husband. Nope. Can be any man who vouches for you is what I understand. You have to get permission to go on Hajj if you're a woman from a relative, a husband, a brother, a son can give you permission if you're the mother to go on Hajj also. Can't a, a cousin do it too? A, Excuse me? A cousin also, a distant relative? I'm not sure that all the relationships. I know that a son, because I know somebody that went that was us. The son had to give permission to the mother to go. So, yeah. and you have to be, if you want me, there has to be in your party, if I understood correctly, if you're a single woman, there has to be a man in that party. It doesn't have to be that, that family member, but you can't just, in any case, you're going to sign up with a group. There is going to be a man in that group. Um, do you have to be Muslim? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You have to have taken Shahada to go uh, because only Muslims are allowed in Mecca and Medina. Other parts of Saudi Arabia, you don't have to be Muslim, but those two cities you do. Uh, and they ask for a uh, certification 
So if you took Shahada with CD or with someone else, you would have gotten a piece of paper. And that's why they give you that piece of paper. So if you got it, hang on to it, you will need it. <laughs> um, so you research the different programs available to us in the United States. And um, you don't necessarily have to go with an American group. Uh, I know Brits who have gone with American groups or Canadian groups. So uh, what matters is that you sign up with a, with a tour group that specializes in this. So we found one um, that was uh, that offered us the comfort level we wanted because at the time we were, I was in my late 60s, David was in his early 70s. And so um, we knew going in the summertime, 114 degrees, that we did not want to rough it. We were beyond roughing. You can go for very rock bottom prices. We paid I don't remember. How I mean, much it was like it was. eighteen thousand or twenty thousand for the two of us for two and a half weeks, everything included, everything. And it, I'm not. Yeah, and, and you will see. This is going to be relevant later on in the talk, but you, you will see all kinds of people from around the world. Some very poor countries. Some. Uh, Rahima was telling of situations from the, some of the countries she visited. So there's, a, there's a very interesting anecdote. We, you know, we're traveling around on air conditioned buses with an imam um, narrating all of the holy sites and all of, all of the holy things we're supposed to be aware of as Muslims as we're doing this. And we're seeing all this poverty with people uh, on Hajj. And the imam said something that, that really struck me. He said, you know, be grateful to Allah that you have the resources to, to travel like this and know that it is basically know that it is from Allah, that each person on Hajj, um, Allah has granted that opportunity. Um, you, you might have, at least we had some Western guilt about <laughs> our luxury accommodations and, and seeing what some of the, the pilgrims uh, we're going through in order to do this holy message. But the Imam's statement really helped. We, you know, we, we accepted it. And um, we saw some way, I, again, I don't wanna, this is a, a real practical thing. I was feeling guilty about all the food that we were eating on this tour and uh, seeing people, very, very poor people uh, out in the, the community. Until one day I came late to lunch. This was when we were in, no, this was when we were in, in, in Mecca. And I saw, and I was, I was appalled by the fact that there was so much food, so many leftovers. But what the tour operator did was at the end of the meal time for the people on the tour, they flipped open the doors, the, 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 the Shutters, the, the, the shutters. shutters at the end of the thing and provided all that food to other pilgrims who didn't have all the food. So we were, we were also supporting feeding other pilgrims, which made me feel a whole lot better. <laughs> so. so, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the nuts and bolts is you do your research, you ask people, what group did you go with? Were you pleased with them? So I'll give you just as a basis of comparison. While we were there, there are two, there were 2 million people there the year we were there and we were in Medina. And <clears throat> to make a long story short, uh, one night, uh, in the middle of the night, Nu is visiting the prophet's tomb, alayhi wa sallam, thinking there were fewer people there. And uh, it was just as crowded as <laughs> during the day, pretty much. But anyway, um, he's there and he runs into Wajib the Laird. Keep in mind, we're not using our cell phones. We have no communication with the Lairds. We had heard vaguely that they were on a different group, group and they were there, but two million people you run into. And then the following night in Medina, I am going to pray outside of the prophet's uh, mosque, which is stunning, absolutely stunning. And I can show you pictures if we have time later on. Um, and uh, again, you know, there are probably a million people around me and I turn to my right and who's standing literally one person away from me, Nora Laird. 
So we were comparing notes about the different groups and their group, um, they had to, uh, they went with a California based group. They had to walk, I think she said 17 miles in the two and a half weeks. They walked a lot and it was very arduous. So what, what I recommend that you do if you are serious about this is ask around. What is your group like? Who was on it? How many people? There were 350 people in our group. Uh, we fell in love with everybody. They were great. Uh, you eat meals with them, you room with them. Um, it's great. We, we were with El, El Medina Travel. Who knows what the situation is these days because COVID has intervened, intervened and affected Taj, but there we go. Yeah. So, so the, uh, Salima I... just posted something very interesting for women that permission is from father or son, okay? But if you are older than 50, this could be changing depending on the Arabi Saudi Arabian embassy requirements for each country. Yeah. And, and I've got a little guidebook here. So I'll just read, just, we don't need to dwell on this too much, but it says a woman must travel with either her husband or another mahram, for example, father, brother, uncle, son, due to visa restrictions. So okay. I hope that's not a big issue for anybody, but that's that's the way it is. Well, in fact, that's um, the case because Salima think... went without her husband. Salima went without her husband. Okay. And I know a lot of women who've gone without their husbands or brother. So. Right, and I think Aisha Jean's question of do they have to be Muslim was referring to the man who gives permission. Does the person who give permission have to be a Muslim because from people from the US don't have relatives who are Muslim. So, okay. I'm not sure about that. That's a good question. I really- You have to witness, two people have to witness you taking the Shahada and I believe they have to be Muslim. I mean, Sidi gave the Shahada to us in a group and then he gave us a paper and he called it the visa because that was the visa that you could go to Hajj. If yeah. you take the promise, you don't get the piece of paper that says here, this is the transcript that you can get into Hajj because yeah. you have to have that in order to go to Medina and Mecca and I, it had was, to be signed. So I was very grateful that I had saved that piece of paper. I, right. <laughs> well, you can take it again. I mean, there's the, the imam on the bus would give you another opportunity and there's other brothers or sisters there that would sign for you too, I'm sure. So. All right. So. Um, where do we go from here? Um, let, should, should we should we talk through the the basic steps of of Hajj and and punctuate it with some of our practical personal stories? Is that is that a good way to proceed? Yeah, I think so. In the pages that I circulated um, that were attached to one of the emails is from the Secrets of Divine Love. Um, it gives the basic pieces of going around the Kaaba at the beginning and then each of those things. So what would be wonderful is that, so they can read these pages to get a little bit more detail. But if you could share your experiences in these different settings, that would just be beautiful. We'll try to share our outer and inner experiences in these settings. And, and in, that, in that other the three pages in Music of the Soul, Sidi talks about Majun and um, Layla, and, and basically Majun is the ecstatic, crazy lover, and Layla is the love. And uh, CD talks in several places about the light and the love of Hajj and bringing you into unity with your Lord. So, um, so we we went to. Let, let's talk about Medina first. Yeah. And our you, you can either do. Med you don't have to do Medina to do Hajj. Hajj is in Mecca, in, in, in the environs around Mecca. But most of the tour groups, I've made all of the ones that I'm aware of, have a Medina component where you either go to Medina before you go to Mecca for Hajj or you go to Medina after Hajj. Um, we, we were with a group that went to Medina before and um, it, was, it was a good warm up. It was a good, it was a good uh, opportunity to pray in the mosque, and uh, I, I need to I need to tell you the other you know four a.m. in the morning. Wadud Laird walked by me 
that, that in the mosque. That was pretty amazing. But there was even a miracle before that. We, we were staying in a hotel and the beautiful Prophet's mosque and the Prophet's tomb is, is in that area. The mosque was built around where the Prophet, the Rauda where the Prophet lived and taught. And so Hassan Amiri from our community was one, was one of my roommates. And so we, we said we would go in the middle of the night, 3 a.m. Less people, right? No, it was wall to wall, shoulder to shoulder, crowded people. We said, okay, we're here, let's do this. We, 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 go, through the, we go through the process. We get to the Rauda and when you're at the prophet's tomb in, the, in this area called the Rauda, you are supposed to do two rakah. And Hassan was adamant he needed to do two rakah. I was saying, there's no way I can do two rakats in this crowd. There's people crowding me in all different directions. But I said to Hassan, because he was really, his tradition, his previous Muslim, he was raised a Muslim, his previous Muslim tradition, it was really important to him. He said, okay, son, I'm a bigger, bigger man than you are. I'm going to make some space here so you can do your two rakats. So I did. I just spread out. Um, there was enough room for Hassan to do his two rakats in a little crowded fashion, but he did it. And I said, okay, I'm not, I'm just not going to be able to do this. We stood up, he stood up and right in front of me, the space opened up widely. I have no idea how this happened. I did my two rakats. That, that was a miracle. I, I guess the other thing I, I want to, 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 to co color the whole thing here, when, when we were preparing for Hajj, one of the things that they recommend to you is expect crazy things to happen, go with the intention of being flexible, basically surrendering to Allah. And so what I just told you was one story where all I could do was laugh. It was so ridiculous what was happening. And because I was so completely surrendered to Allah in the moment, this miracle happened. So, you know, everybody's miracles are gonna be different, but I can just tell you, and there'll probably be more examples that we might talk about, that when you, when you go with the attitude of just completely surrendering to Allah, which is actually what the walking's all about, isn't it? Um, miraculous things happen. I wanna talk a little bit about the inner visit to Medina. This is um, the prophet city, alayhi wa sallam, um, where he, when he had to leave, and you've heard about this uh, many, many times, Sidi writes about it, it's in the Quran, when he had to leave Mecca, and he went to Medina. And um, when you arrive in Medina, you are absolutely overwhelmed by the physical beauty of the place. The Prophet's Mosque, which has, of course, been built up and enlarged, it's constantly being enlarged, but it's just, it just has this grace and beauty about it, which is stunning, absolutely stunning. And you're in his city, so you feel his spirit. With his tomb. You're right next to his tomb, and there is something very... Um, magical about that something very deep very profound it's a different connection than you have with him living in silver spring maryland as we do <laughs> you're right there in the on the land that he walked on uh, the community he built the mosque that he built the tomb where his body was laid to rest you're right there and you right I remember being there and kind of pinching myself the whole time. I couldn't believe that I was in the midst of the place where, where he thrived, where he built a community. So that's one of the inner journeys that I remember experiencing, appreciating so much. It was, it, as I said, it was a warm up for the Hajj, but you got to warm up to that 
deep, deep, deep connection with our Lord. And, you know, again, on the, on the outer, the tours also have bus tours around to other holy sites around Medina. So, and, and so there, there we are. So when, in our case, it's time, it's time to head to Mecca for the Hajj. It's a, about a six hour, six or eight hour, depending on traffic, six or eight hour bus ride between Medina and Mecca. And this is where we talk about Ikhram. And, right. Um, Let me read this. At, at a, there's there's a partic particular places called Mikat. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But particular places where you, as you're heading to Mecca for Hajj, you need to, to enter this state of purity called Ikhram. And uh, for, um, for men, that means you have these, yeah, this is not doing it justice, but towel-like things that you wrap around. They're basically big sheets. Big, big, <laughs> she big sheets. You, you take, you know, you take, you can put your underwear on, of course, but you take out all the other stuff. Everybody, wear, all the men wear the same thing. And there's no differentiation of status or anything like that. And it's this white cloth and you you say prayers and you, you do what you need to do to be in this state of purity. And you do that at a particular place as you're entering the holy area around, uh, around Mecca. So Samah. And the women, um, yeah. the women also enter the state of purity, but for some, Odd reason, I don't know the history of this. Um, women can wear whatever they want as long as they, it's, you know, Muslim type clothing uh, and covering everything. Everything. Not one hair can be shown. But not your face. But not your face, which is interesting because in Saudi Arabia, you might have seen the women in Saudi Arabia do cover the face, the, um, they wear the burqas. Um, but on Hajj, you're not allowed to cover the face. And the, I mean, there's, we're, we're, we're talking about the outer practical things, all kinds of rules that you have to follow. And I, I just say something here too, quickly. Sure. sure. That in Medina, the women and the men have to be se separated. They can't be together. You're in one part of the, the mosque, the men are in another part of the mosque. If you're gonna visit the tomb of the prophet, the women can go at a specific time. The men are allowed to go at another time. There's no mixing allowed. However, when you go to Mecca, the women and the men, they're all together. They're all walking around. It's the only place that they look at and say, this is allowed. CD talks about this in his books. He says, you know, this is, a, this is not right what they're doing, separating the men and the women. And he says that we're all from Adam. And he doesn't mean that Adam is the man but he means that adam is the human being and there's no difference between the man and the woman you see oh he is she and she is he and right. he talks about that a lot so uh he tried to bring that together when he was in jerusalem and he would do some zickers in jerusalem and people were having flipping out but when he came here you would see cd actually give an embrace to women he would hug them or something like that Jerusalem, you wouldn't see CD do that at all. Yeah. So it was just, yeah. yeah. It's, part of it is cultural and part of it is tradition. So um, thank you for reminding us of that, though. That's, yes, there is a separation. That's definitely perfect because so it, we probably don't need, I don't know, you tell, decide what you want to tell the whole story. But Sama had a very different experience at the prophet's tomb than I did. It related, it's a very much related to what yeah. you said about the separation of men and women. Yeah, it's um, a detail. I don't feel like I need to share that. One other, you know, real practical thing. Uh, we we did not stay in the same room together uh, during this trip. We you know we were we were nearby all the time, but um, part of it was for money, but part of it is uh, related to the fact that the men and the women are having their 
college experience separately? There are some places, if you do want to stay with your beloved, there are some places, I don't remember if it's in Medina or Mecca, I think it's in Medina, where you can stay with your husband or wife. But uh, I believe once you get to Mecca, um, you are always separated. So close, close by, but and you, but you have to pay a lot of money. And we looked at each other and we said, do we want to spend $300 a night to spend the night with each other? Eh, we can do that. So we... Especially since there's no marital relations during the Hajj anyway. So anyhow, right. so, so we, we room, I roomed with three other men and she roomed with several other women and, but we were close enough and we, we're able to have meals together and so forth. Yeah. So, so anyhow, so we got to Mikat and it was time to go into Ikram. And Sama has something that Sidi wrote about Ikram. So Sidi writes, there are three pillars, three pillars on Hajj. The first of these pillars concerns what is forbidden, al Ikram. This means that as soon as the owner of the station puts on the clothes of Al Ikram, everything that was permitted for him before this moment is now forbidden, in addition to what is normally forbidden. This is because of the magnitude and the holiness in this station. And it is true, when you see one million men walking around, all dressed the same. Nobody's carrying their wallets, they're not carrying you know, their keys, their computers, nothing like that. It is breathtaking because it is the great equalizer. And you realize that that's the purity, having nothing, having no possessions. Yeah. Most of the time you're barefoot, except when you're out on the street, of course. So you enter the state of Ikram. That's it. Okay. So then, so then we get to Mecca, and our experience, the experience that so many people write about, is the first time that you enter the holy mosque, see the Kaaba, it just takes your breath away. Except for someone I know, myself, uh -huh. this did not happen. So people told me, oh my goodness, when you see the Kaaba, and of course I'd seen pictures of the Kaaba, and I was so excited, and Hassan Amiri had already gotten there, and he'd scoped everything out, and he takes a bunch of us from our community, um, our Sufi community, and he said, I'm going to take you over to, to see the Kaaba. And by this time, I am sick. Now, most people waited you know, maybe a little further into Hajj before they get sick. I got sick early on, decided to get it over with, which I didn't, but <laughs> it stayed with me the whole time. Everyone gets sick. Everyone gets, I've never heard of anyone who, dis, who didn't get sick. Maybe somebody did, I don't know, but it's very unusual. Everyone gets sick because you were with, a, you know, two million people and you're close and you're praying together. So you can imagine all the germs floating around. Anyway, um, when I saw the Kaaba, my first thought, a stock for Alazim, this is terrible. My first thought was, why didn't I bring more Kleenex with me? I'm really suffering here. And where is the wow experience? So there's another side of Hajj that we, most people don't talk about, is that people get your expectations up and not people, culture, society, you know, oh, the Kaaba is the most magnificent building on the face of this planet, you know, it's so holy and everything. And some of us didn't have that experience. And this, <laughs> and this is an, ex, this is an, you know, I had a good experience, not, a, not as much of a wow as some to write about, but this is a good example of the point that we're gonna make all the way through this is, stuff crazy stuff is going to happen and the only the only attitude you can have is just surrender to it whatever whatever your experience is 
whether it's ecstatic, there's going to be ecstatic moments. And, and this is part of the rituals of Paj as well. But you're going to have ecstatic moments and you're going to have blah moments. And all you can do is surrender to them and Allah will take care of it. Yeah. He's, he's, he's organizing this whole thing. And there were other times when something that shouldn't have moved me, moved me to tears. You know, something, I can't, I don't know, someone on the street that I saw who, who was from Africa and was supported as Rahima was talking about people in, the, in some communities that get support from the entire community. Well, in Africa, you saw a lot of uh, people that wear, would wear like a cape or a label on the backs that said uh, supported by the Bank of Cameroon, for example, or something like that, you know, and I would just burst out in tears because realizing these people had nothing and a law was providing for them through their community or through a business or something like that. So it's, you have these emotional moments um, that are not explainable or logical. All right, so here we're, we're doing what's actually called Umrah, the beginning when we first arrive in, in Mecca and entering the Holy Mosque. And you may have heard about circumambulating the Kaaba seven times. Sidi writes about it in Music of the Soul and probably other books as well. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read a little bit, just a couple sentences from this uh, that relate to that that first time in, in, in the Holy Mosque. So many of the veils are burnt in the Holy Hajj and hidden within every ritual act. In the, is the, every ritual act is the annihilating flame. First, he circumnav, circumambulates the Kaaba seven times. And then in this turning, he walks through the stations of the self. So the, the first seven stations of walking to Allah is symbolized, is represented, is experienced by these seven circumambulations of the Kaaba. And there's particular ways that you do it. Um, uh, and, and, it and it's a holy experience. I, I can tell you that Sama is a, a little bit, a little bit <laughs> less favorable toward crowds than I am. So one, one place, one way you can circumambulate the Kaaba is on the ground level, and boy, is it crowded. <laughs> and, and you can go around and around. So we actually went around the, that first time, we went around three times together on the ground level. And you, you go around, and every time you get to the black, the, 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 you couldn't, it was just so crowded, you couldn't actually get to the black stone on the Kaaba. But every time you got to the place where the black stone was, you you made your prayers and you made your gesture to the Kaaba. Then you started on your next Tawa, the next circumambulation. After about three times, the crowd was too much for us. And so we went up. There's a, a structure all the way around it. And you can different levels. Different levels. There's two or three levels. So we went up to the second level, which was less crowded. The disadvantage is it's a longer walk, but the advantage, of course, is that it's much less crowded. So we did that. And uh, oh, we, we pray that Allah accepted our Hajj and we thought, we thought everything went well. It's still crowded, by the way. But so can I read what Sidi writes about that sure. too? So he talks about the fourth pillar of the Hajj is to circle around the holy house to walk. After the standing on Arafat. So this. No, no, it's later. This requires returning to the manifestation of the essence. No? It's after Arafat. This is not about the Papa? No. The Holy no, House. No, yeah. Not, not at the beginning here. No, but you come back. Oh, right. okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. You come you, back you do, after you, you go this, to Arafat. You do this several times. And I was, I was just talking about I the jumped first ahead. Time. Yeah. So I jumped ahead to later on after you do several of the practices, you come back. So what he talks about, though, is he says that um, this requires returning to the manifestation of the essence, which has the right to the meanings and abstract relationships of the divine names. 
And what people very often do is they recite the divine qualities or attributes as they're going around. So that's a very common tradition. It's not required. It's not. You know, there's, there's other recommended prayers that. Yeah, that there are other do. prayers that you do as a record. Okay, so after those after those first seven circumambulations, where you're walking through the stations of the nafs, station, the ego, then you go get some Zam Zam water. <laughs> and again, CD writes about that. Then she she Layla, Allah. Then she leads him to the well, her deep secret spring. This is Zamzam. This is, again, you may all be aware that this is the, the never ending spring that um, Hagar. 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 That yeah. when, when Ibrahim dropped, left her in the desert. His wife, his, his wife and his son in the desert. This is the spring that popped up. This is Zamzam. It, C.D. writes about it as, um, she leads him to the deep secret spring where the mercy of Allah sprang forth in the desert. So Zamzam water, and we've heard this before in our path and our tradition, that water is about purification and mercy. And, and so this ritual of drinking and pouring over your head zamzam water on Hajj is symbolic of, is a ritual that is related to Allah's mercy, as I understand it. So. And it is merciful when it's 114 degrees <laughs> outside. And you're thirsty. <laughs> and you've just been walking it's around really the, the Kaaba for seven times yeah. and you're thirsty. Yeah. So, so after, after zamzam, then you do something called Sa'in. So this is the second pillar. Can I read this? Um, sure. This is a kind of a, some people think it's a fun part and other people think it's arduous. The second pillar is the Sa'i, spelled S-A long I, Sa'i, which is the right of hastening between the signs of Safa and Marwa. This is the turning of the knower from side to side between the beauty of Allah, Al Jamal, and His Majesty, Al Jalal, until the Jalal becomes the essence of the Jamal for him as a result of the destruction of his self, his desires, and his will. So, this is really about surrender again. And so seven times you go from, you start at Safa up on a little hill, and you, this, uh, this is where Hagar and was running back and forth, back and forth. Between two hills. Between two hills, trying to figure out how am I going to survive in the desert here? Um, again, that's my understanding. Forgive me if that's wrong. But yeah, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. And she had left, she had left Ismail in the sand and uh, Haga went running back and forth between the two hills right. seven times looking is there anyone out there any birds any any people anything here and okay. there was nothing and she came back and after seven times I think she settled with Ismail and uh, I think it was Ismail that was digging his feet into the sand and that's where the water popped up that's and she got a little bit panicky at that time and I think she asked Allah, you know, she was going to drown or something. So Allah, the, the way I read the story was that there would be a big river or something that would be in Medina, but the river stopped. He didn't let the water keep coming up, but it became like a well. And uh, the well actually attracted the birds and then the people that were on traveling back and forth from whatever towns or cities from Yemen to Egypt or whatever. They saw that the birds were there. That they realized that that was an indication that there was water because that would be the only thing that would be drawing them there. So that was why they went to the Zamzam, and that was a blessed uh, well. And uh, it also, I remember saying that you could drink as much of the Zamzam water as you wanted to, 
and not feel full or anything like that. But the other part of it is that it also has to come out. So don't forget that part of it. So <laughs> I found that out myself. So there's another example of the outer Hajj <laughs> experience. Thank you. <laughs> but, but again, this perfectly illustrates that here's this historical mm -hmm. example of, you know, the, what happened in our, in our tradition and the, the symbolic nature of it, and Sidi writes about it very clearly. This was very, very powerful for me when I, I was reading this as, as I was getting prepared to do this, that the notion of symbolically going between Jamal and Jalal, back to Jamal and Jalal, back to Jamal, seven times, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, until there is no difference. One becomes the other. And the whole Hajj is about Jamal and Jalal. The entire Hajj, you know, we mentioned the food. There's the Jamal. I mean, we had fabulous food. Um, you, see, you see beauty in Medina, Jamal. And then your feet get so tired, circumambulating. You're, you get hot. Uh, you're thirsty, uh, you're tired, but you still have to do more prayers. So the Jalal is always there as well. And with the surrender, what happens is you start to say, oh my goodness, it's all one. It's all one. And it's really, a, I think it's a beautiful station to be in when you arrive there because you can draw up on that the rest of your life. And, and, you know, we're not telling you all of the crazy things that happened to us, but again, if, if you have the attitude that this is all from Allah, taking you between the Jamal and the Jalal, again, I found myself laughing at some of the things that would have distressed me completely uh, if, I, if I didn't know that, if I wasn't opening my heart to the love and the light of Allah. So after you, after you do that, there's, a, there's a, a couple of days that you're still in Mecca and you can go back to the mosque, you know, as much as you want. Some people sort of camped out in there and never, almost never showed up in the hotel. Others of us went back to the hotel and then from time to time. Um, so there was, I, I wanna tell a little story because this is, this is another miracle story for me. And again, everybody's miracles are gonna be different. I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting you're gonna have my miracle, but I, I, I do believe you're gonna have your miracle. And so, you know, it's wonderful to touch the Kaaba, uh, the Kaaba and to kiss the black stone. And it's awful hard, to, it's not required. It's awful hard to do when there's 2 million people trying to do all of this stuff in the same time period. So one night, Sama went to the mosque in the, you know, in the middle of the night. I was too tired. I rested up. The next night, she was tired. And I went to the mosque and I said, OK, I'm not so worried about crowds. I'm going to see how close to the Kaaba I can get. So I just, you know, just I'm, Six one, two hundred and some pounds. I, I, you know, just got into the crowd and worked closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. And um, I was able to get close enough to the Kaaba that at the Yamani corner, there's one of the corners before you get to where the black stone is. I was I was able to get close to the Kaaba, and I just was able to get my hand up and to touch the Kaaba. And uh, again, I, I had an undeniable spiritual experience. This energy just surged through my hand, through my, through my arm. <laughs> and I spent the rest of the night until Fajr prayer. I, well, actually then I continued around and it was a madhouse right at the Black Stone. It, you know, people were, so crowded, it was hot, people were sweating, uh, the, the, there was wetness all over the place and it wasn't water, it was people's perspiration. Sweat, perspiration. Yeah. People were lifted yeah. up, literally, I, it happened to me, I weighed two, 210, 220 pounds. I, the crowd was so, I got lifted up. It, it was 
crazy. And I said, Sama would not like this at all. <laughs> but I said, okay, I'm gonna get to the black stone. And I said, just I put my shoulder put my shoulder out, but I actually got to touch the black stone. I didn't get to kiss it. It was just too it was just not possible. And then I said, okay, let me get out of here. <laughs> and but from that energy that when I touched the Kaaba at the Yamini corner and I probably from what I experienced, uh, you know, wrestling my way to the Blackstone. I spent the rest of the night just circumambulating the Kava uh, in, in a state of tears. Uh, tears, I was crying, you know, I was, pray I was praying and crying and uh, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. So again, there's no, no guarantee that everybody's gonna have an experience like that they're certainly not going to have my experience but if you're if your heart is open to it Allah will give you what you need and sometimes it will be fairly spectacular and that that is a spectacular moment that I'll never mm. forget it's bringing tears to my eyes right now thinking about it and I was praying for my son I was now we're moving to Arafat right no, no I'm talking okay. about when I was wandering oh, around okay. right Okay, so that. So I'm just looking at the time. It's okay, we gotta go. Stuff. So the next thing you do mm -hmm. is you you move to a place called uh, Nina. Nina. The tent city. Big big tent city. <clears throat> and we're there. <laughs> <laughs> now wait a minute. Yeah, and you think, oh great, you're gonna live in a tent, 114 degrees. That's where everyone gets sick. Yeah. From that. Because yeah. you're all in close proximity Very and close they got air conditioners running and you're all just stuck in a tent. So yeah. and, and everyone. I, I had not gotten sick until the end of the time in Minna when Sam <clears throat> and Miri came back from wherever he was. He was a spiritual warrior. warrior. He, was, <laughs> he came back and he looked at me and he said, you haven't gotten sick yet? <laughs> and then you got and, sick. In, in a, a few short hours, I got sick. <laughs> But Minna is an interesting place. Um, it's also where you throw pebbles at the shaitan. Yeah, not until that. Yeah, not yet, but yes. So I liked Minna. People complain about it. I liked it. Why? Because we had ergonomic beds. They were little wheel recliners that went down. I had comfort. Um, we had organic sheets and pillowcases. I'm telling you, this was class. There was an ice cream stand right outside our door. <laughs> Have ice cream whenever you want. I liked Mina. I thought it was fun being with all these women in close quarters. And, you know, we were sharing our stories and giggling and laughing. For me, it was community and it was women together. Um, women from all over the world. You don't know who you're going to be put with. And I, some of them speak your language and some of them don't. Um, I loved it. I loved Minna. A lot of people don't. I thought it was great. I had a men's experience. The men's experience wasn't exactly the same as the <laughs> women's experience. But it, but it, it again, you were in the tent with, I don't know how many, 15, 20 people. Probably, yeah. yeah. I, 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 did, did you have a tent experience with a number of people in Minna? I believe that the, I went in 2010, and I think that they announced that there was around 3 million people on Hajj at that time. And it was a little bit, I won't say crazy, but it was close to that. I mean, the buses, you could, the buses lined up to carry us different places, but you could actually walk from one bus to the other. They were all lined up so far. Did, so, you, stay, did you stay in tents in Minna? Before? Oh yeah, with the air conditioners. That's where we got sick. Yeah, so before going to Arafat. And then we went to then we went to Arafat and then spent the day in Arafat. And then when sundown came, that's when we went over to uh Mustalifa, yeah. and that's where you you pick up all your stones and you spend the night there, and then get up the next morning and all that stuff. Then you go back to Minna. So, so what he's talking about, and we're going to speed this up a little bit because of the time, um, is um, the buses. I want to just say one thing about the buses. <laughs> the year we were there was two million people estimated. Um, there were ten thousand buses used. So 
So the Saudis have this army of buses. And in some ways, the Saudis are super prepared. I'm talking about the outer now, super prepared to receive all these people. And in other ways, they are not prepared at all. So um, when you are trying to find your bus, you're in a sea of fumes, because the buses all congregate the same place, you know, a bus parking lot. And you're trying to find your bus, you're walking through fumes and they are absolutely devastating, particularly if you're a sensitive person as I am. Um, the other thing that was very troublesome for me, but it, it turned out to be kind of a miracle, I have to tell my story, but um, the Saudis hand out when, not only when you're in, in Mecca uh, with the Zamzam water and you're encouraged to bring your own bottle and refill Zamzam because it's more ecological, but not everybody in the world has gotten that message about the climate change and ecology and single use bottles. So a lot of people would be drinking from a plastic bottle and then they toss it. Where do they toss it? On the street. There's no recycling in Saudi Arabia, at least it wasn't in 2017. This was devastating to me because I am not joking. Imagine 2 million people drinking how many? 10 bottles of water a day with no place to put them. You put them on the ground. People were literally walking on top of plastic bottles. This was so troublesome for me. I started, I started crying and I started praying about it. I got back home. I called our dear friend who's passed away, uh, John Whalen, I mean Whalen, who was a he's he was very famous actually, a pretty well known uh, man who worked in ecology. And I said, what do I do about this? I can't live with this. And he said, you're one woman, how are you gonna change the Saudis? He said, find out who's selling all those bottles. He's probably a member of the royal family. I kept praying about it, I kept praying about it. About a month after I came home, I was a, a business consultant. I went to a place in Pennsylvania that is this big, it's called Blue Belt, Pennsylvania. And I'm staying in a hotel, I have a client meeting the next day, I'm staying in a hotel and I go down for breakfast and I see a Muslim couple there. And I don't know if other people will do this if you go on Hajj, but I got a little crazy about it. And I would walk up to Muslims and I'd say, hi, my name is Samar Ross. I just came back from Hajj. Because you, you want to tell the experience. You need, you need community. You need to talk about this experience. You know. So I, this is how I announced myself. And then, oh, please sit down with us. We're from Turkey. Please sit down, sit down. He was an engineer who had studied in the United States. He was showing his wife the America. And so I we're talking about this whole experience. They had a lottery in Turkey because in the United States, we have no problems going on Hajj. There's a quota for every country. But if you live in a Muslim country where there are a lot of Muslims, you might have to wait for years before you can get in under that quota. And that's the case with Turkey. So they had been waiting to go on Hajj for years. And um, so we talked about the experience and everything. And I said, uh, what, what kind of engineer are you? And he said, um, I studied ecology. I'm an environmental engineer. And I said, oh my gosh. So I started telling him about this whole thing about the water bottles and everything. And he said, well, that's very interesting because I just set up a foundation. This is how Allah works. I'm telling the story to show you the absolute craziness of the coincidences. He said, I've set up a foundation to address ecological issues and climate change in Muslim countries. And they were starting with um, uh, the former Yugoslavia, some of the Muslim parts there and Turkey. And I'm still friends with him on WhatsApp. He wrote to me about four years ago and he said, Alhamdulillah, we finally were able to go on Hajj. And I, my attention is on this ecological problem you mentioned. This is how Allah works. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> right. So picking up the steps and the rituals of Hajj, what I failed to mention earlier when we were talking about the Sa'id between Safa and Marwa, um, what Sidi writes about is that as you're, as you're doing, let's, let me read it. In, in his travels, Layla leads Majun, in other words, the love leads the ecstatic lover through the seven stations of the heart. So the Safada Marwa is the walking through the seven stations of the heart. 
Then we went to Minna, as we talked about a minute ago. The next step is to go to Mount Arafat. And um, that's a very holy day. You spend a whole day at Arafat. You can't get there before sunrise and you have to leave. You can't leave until after sunset. That's also a day that we fast here, right. if you're able to. So that's a highly recommended day to fast. We, we had snacks, but <laughs> we weren't. You don't fast on Hajj, by the way. You don't. You don't fast when you're over there. We fast when you're not at, at Mecca. Yeah, yeah. So, but but it, being at Arafat is a very holy day, and you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray and. Um, they don't, they don't recommend that you climb up the mountain anymore, but there's a whole area that is designated as Arafat. It's, it's right in that area. Sidi writes, um, then, then he ascends Mount Arafat, the mountain of knowing, to offer himself as Ishmael was offered, giving everything to the unity. Then Layla gives him holy and more holy dresses from her dress until his existence is only her existence, i.e. we're talking about metaphorically about the unity here. And so that's, that's what the Arafat day is all about. Um, if you want to know what, we had a tent, we had an air conditioned tent there also, but we spent a lot of time outside praying. Um, you pray the whole day. It's pray, really beautiful. Pray the whole day. And, uh, being older, we were up there in ages. Um, we had permission to leave a little early. So um, the, most of our group was going to go to the train to go back to, to uh, Musta, Mustalifa and back to Minna. Um, we were going to go on a bus with the older people or people that had disabilities or, you know, had some. Uh, or women. Or women, women, older people, people that had difficulty walking and tech. What an adventure getting to the 10,000 buses Samal was talking about. So we, again, speaking of ridiculous experiences that turned out to be very holy experiences, we were wandering around, up and down, around buses, trying to find buses. People were supposed, somebody was supposedly guiding us to the right buses. They didn't know where they were going. We finally found our buses. When Maghrib came in, the, uh, all, all the buses lined up, head out all at the same time. It's, it's a it's caravan. A, it's a madhouse, right? A, a, a madhouse. And you're, you're supposed to go to this area called Mustalifa, and you're supposed to spend the night there before you go back to Minna and, and throw stones at the shaitan, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, our bus was, it, the traffic jam was horrendous. You know, just got to surrender. We, we got there late. It took a long, long time to get there. Our bus pulled up to this area. And this is where it gets really ridiculous. First of all, we were downwind from a latrine. From the, <laughs> the toilets were right there. <laughs> toilets were right and there. And you're supposed to get out and pray. You're supposed to get out and pray. So it's. It's a little problematic. Not only that, the mm -hmm. buses were still running, so you had exhaust fumes. Yes. <laughs> and some some brothers on the bus told all the women to get back on the bus. And of course, the women said, no way, brother. Yeah, they said, go, <laughs> go inside the bus and pray. Have you ever tried to pray in a bus? I mean, it's not easy. What they did do, though, which was funny, was they open up the luggage compartment of the bus and they threw out these absolutely stunning prayer rugs huge prayer rugs and they just put them on the ground with the fumes in your face it was a very uh it's unforgettable experience <laughs> and a i mean it's, it's it's you know it it's it's a part it's a, it's a rit, it's a ritual that is symbolic of our walking to allah we've just been at arafat we, we just united with our lord and here's this situation that you face and you, there's, you got you got nothing to do but surrender. I mean, if you spend your time complaining about it, you're missing the you're missing the beauty and the value of 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 Hajj. And I just, I just want to interject something about Arafat. I believe that I 
sure. my recollection is anyway, is that that's where Adam and Hawa met from when they were separated and sent down to earth. Yes. It's also where Abraham Salam, tried to sacrifice Ismail. Exactly. And that's when the angel came down and offered the sheep because he said that they both surrendered. And I believe it's also the place that the prophet alayhi salam gave his last uh, sermon from Mount Arafat. So there's a lot of <laughs> prophetic energy and everything else there. Adam to Ibrahim to Muhammad's last speech. It's, 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 a, it's a very holy place. It's a very holy place. That's why you spend the day there, actually. But here's the inner part of that, is that this was a very uncomfortable time at least for me, uh, during the Hajj. And, uh, you know, between the bus fumes and trying to get to the bus and trying to find a place to pray in front of toilets. And it, I was just in deep discomfort, physical discomfort. And I just always had to just take a breath with the fumes and tell myself, but where is Allah? And where is my attention? That is part of the surrender that happens during Hajj. It's not a beach vacation it, for a reason. <laughs> I mean, Allah, I, I, again, my, my interpretation, Allah has organized it this way. If you don't surrender, you're gonna suffer. You're gonna suffer. Because crazy stuff is gonna happen. If you surrender, sometimes all you can do is take a breath, say, all right, what's Allah making here? And and enjoy. And ask, and ask for mercy. Ask I mean, for mercy. You know, you're in such pain sometimes, physical pain. You're so uncomfortable. You have to turn and ask for Rahim Rahman. So we didn't spend a, as much time in Musalifa as theoretically we were supposed to, because again, we were with the older group. Uh, the, and the women. The women. Well, and and anyhow, we we the Hajj ritual provisions allowed us to head back to Mina um, sooner than, uh, most Most of the pilgrims were supposed to spend the night in Mustalifa, pray there, and then at dawn, walk back to Mina. And this is, by the way, you don't stay in a five-star hotel. No, Salima no. told me she slept on a rock all night. Yeah, that's, so that's basically It's not out. like you check into a hotel, right? That, 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 <laughs> That that night is you got to surrender. That that one's a rough one. There's there's no there's no tents. There's no nothing accommodations. No. There's, there's stones there's, on the ground. There's toilet. There's toilets, and if you're on if you're downwind from it, you, you got to deal with that. Anyhow, we got on the buses. Short. We got we did our two rakats. We got back on the buses. And they took us back to Minna, and uh, basically, uh, Ayub alluded before that. Mustalifa is a place where you're supposed to start gathering stones that, you, that you're going to, the truth is you can gather your stones wherever you need to gather your stones, but the, the, the ritual is you start gathering stones in Mustalifa that you're going to use to throw at the shaitan, to subjugate the shaitan. There's, there's also, I want to say that, you know, in preparing to go for Hajj, there's a lot of preparation um, that you need to do studying that, I mean, what happens where you go, what you say, yep. a lot of stuff like that. And, you know, you get there and it's like, everything goes right out the window. Huh? It's like, you know, at least for me, that was the way. So I just said, well, you know, but uh, I was, I was very fortunate. Uh, our group also went with El Medina travel and it was in November that I was there. So it was a lot cooler, yeah. a lot cooler. I would not have survived if it was in the middle of the summer. But uh, all the people that we were with, that we traveled with were all from Atarika and from uh, everyone. I mean, really? I know Salima Edelstein was with us and uh, Marzatar sure. and uh, Mohammed Musa. And I can't, I really can't remember who else, but there were five women and five men. The five men stayed in one hotel. The five women stayed in another hotel on a Kim different Lushen. floor. Kamala Shinman was with you too, wasn't she? Yeah, 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 that's another one. Martin, so. Martin and Manager were on that. He mentioned that, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah Manager was with, with Mars, yeah. 
So, I mean, we had a lot of community that, you know, yeah. was really very nice for us too. Yeah. So. so let me, I, I, I appreciate the comments that you're making here that I, I think you're absolutely right that preparation, I did a fair amount of preparation and I would encourage anybody going on Hajj to do that preparation and really familiarize yourself with what's going to happen and as best you can, what the prayer, you know. And if you're with a, a good travel agency, you've got people that are uh, imams with you and, and other people with you that are going to walk you through some of the things. So you don't, there's, there's several things that are required for an acceptable Hajj. And then there's a bunch of other stuff that there's some flexibility on. And so, you know, the, the tour guides are gonna guide you to make sure that you do what you have to do for for the yeah. for the, the Hajj to be acceptable. And I think what Ayuba is also talking about is there are special prayers that you do along the right, way. Right. Yeah. So we, when we finished when we finished our Hajj, we called CD up in Jerusalem. Wow. <laughs> he told us, he said, yes. Beloved, yes, you all, all of you, like little babies now, hungry <laughs> lines, tell us, brand new. Well, all this you know, I, I, a lot of people, I, I got this little book, which also has all the prayers in it, and yeah, you can, it help, helps to guide you through it. All right, yeah. so now we're back. Too many stories, too, too many stories. Too many stories. We have six yeah, minutes. the time is getting short, so. Okay, so we're back in Minna. Three days, you throw seven stones at each of three shaitan, uh, subjugate them, and then the shaitan. By the way, the when, you, when you're throwing it, you're throwing it a big pillar, a concrete wall, basically. So it's and kind then, of fun. <laughs> and and so you you're back in Minna, then then you go back to your hotel, and you, there's another there's another how um, I'm blanking in. How what? You circumambulate the Kaaba and you do this Safa to Marwa again before you leave town. Um, so that, that's walking through all of the different steps. And then either you go home or some of the people are then going to Medina afterwards. So I, I hope we were successful in um, giving you the over, you know, there's a lot more detail, as I said, you, you yeah. got somewhere, it. somewhere along the way, you get a haircut too. And I forget where that oh, is. Yeah, yeah, right. you get women, your you can just get a little piece of hair for your women. Yeah, Men are supposed to get their head shaved. And I so. was, I was a, a professional consultant at the time. So I, I hope a lot accepted my Hajj. I, I got my hair trimmed very short, but I did not shave my head. But the the, the the recommended thing is that the don't worry, don't worry about it. Allah knows your intention. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I I I didn't skip that step, but I, I you know, I I had guidance that said it was okay just to get it cut short, not to have a it, lot of people do, not yeah. to have it shaved. And the women, you just clip a little piece, you know, it's not a big deal. So you know, we so, we we tried to give you an overview of the the, the process, but some of the practical things we ran into, some of the outer things we ran into, but there were, there were and still are profound inner experiences as a result of the Hajj. So as, as crazy as it is sometimes, we are strong advocates of people accomplishing this pillar if they are physically and financially able to do so. And it is accessible to everyone. Rahima started out by saying, well, for many of us, it's kind of a mythical thing, you know, hypothetical thing, but no, no. If your heart is called to do Hajj, keep praying and asking for that opening to go wider and wider. You'll be surprised what Allah gives you. It's a beautiful experience. It's life changing. Uh, it brings you, of course, closer to Allah. And that is the whole objective. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, right? Or comments? Yeah, we if do. Anybody, and I'd be happy to stay on and show pictures if anybody is interested in that. I don't know how late you want to stay up, Rahima. <laughs> so I'm, if not very late here, later for you. So I, when I said, you know, it seems like a fantasy, I think that you've grounded it 
in like these are real people doing real things and coping with the real things that it throws at you, you know? And so that was what I was really hoping, hoping to hear more about. So it wouldn't just be like, Oh, and you float through it because we all know that's not true. You know? so. but, but again, the point is that I, I, I have to believe that that's a law's design to put you have, these trials. I'm not questioning. I'm not questioning. <laughs> I'm mean, just saying, no, you know, nobody, when we have no conception of what it's like that you're surrendering yeah. to. We, yeah. we gave you our, some of our examples of the challenges, but I don't know of anybody that's ever gotten through Hajj without challenges. Exactly. That's, that's exactly. Part, of the, part of the design. Exactly. Exactly. You alluded to the profound changes that last afterward. Do you want to say any more about that? And then, yes, we will have time for some pictures and questions. Well, um, for me, it's I draw upon those moments when I need strength and strength in all aspects of strength. <laughs> So David mentioned that I'm not a fan of crowds. I hate crowds. <laughs> he was being gentle. I hate crowds and I am small. And um, people around the world don't have the same uh, notion of physical space between one another as we do in the United States. <laughs> and so literally people were running over me, into me, lifting me up sometimes. And a lot of these people, vast majority of these people were bigger than me. So I had physical fear sometimes. What also I think was really important for me is it brought us closer together. My husband protected me. Now in the United States, he doesn't usually have to do that. We're walking down the street, you know, I'm fine. He doesn't have to protect me. He had to physically protect me. This, this was a, a big walking for an independent, you know, liberated, so-called liberated woman. I, I found a beauty in that. I found uh, a beauty in taking my entire agenda and making it about it. You're not opening your mail. You're not cleaning your kitchen. You're not doing your dishes. You're not thinking about your next meal. Well, you're thinking about your next meal. You're not cooking it. <laughs> you're not shopping. You're not really in the world. You're in Allah's world. That was the huge profound change for me is completely getting rid of every of, of the dunya in some ways. I want to answer that question by saying that for me that I, I'm not claiming to be in the highest station in any way, shape or form. But since the Hajj, I am so much more surrendered in whatever happens in my life. I, I, That's that, true. I've seen that. Video. The Hajj yeah. taught me to trust, you know, that everything is from Allah and everything from Allah is ultimately good. And I just need to surrender to whatever he's making in the moment. And it's going to be good for me. I, I, again, I'm not perfect at that. Uh, I don't know if I ever will. Allah only knows. But there's a palpable difference in the depth of my surrender as a result of Hajj. And I, I, there's a couple quick stories that I want, I forgot to tell. When we're circumambulating the Kava, you wouldn't be, you would be amazed at all the different nationalities pushing and shoving and go. I can't tell you how many children pushing their elderly parents around in wheelchairs, people who had saved money their whole life to be able to go on Hajj before they passed away. I, I honestly, I swear to God, this happened. I saw at, at least one, maybe, maybe two people on medical carts with IVs in their arms being yeah, pushed that. around Kava so that they could, you know, they're probably on death's doorstep uh, and, and they wanted to make Hajj before they passed away. It was, in, I'm going to cry just talking about it. It was incredibly moving. You saw, you know, youngish parents with their little kids on Hajj. You saw older children pushing their elderly parents around. You saw people on their deathbed. 
we went up to the third level one night because the second level was a little hectic. We almost got run over by wheelchairs up there. <laughs> the third we, level is for we, wheelchairs. We made, we made one, one circumambulation on the third level and we said, we got to get out of here because people were running over our ankles with their wheels. It, but, but the experience of that, uh, you know, and, and it was just, it was, it was very, very, very moving. To, to, and to, you know, we've alluded to it, it. There's a lot more that could be said about all the different things that people go through to be able to, to complete their Hajj. It's, it's, it's amazing. Can I just share one thing that my observation that I've carried back from Hajj Great. is that you have 3 million people doing all this running around and everything else. And all of a sudden the call to prayer goes off. Yeah. And within two minutes, you get three million people who could hear a pin drop and they're all praying. It's like, how do you organize three million people to do something of that magnitude? You can't even, sometimes you can't even organize five or 10 people <laughs> and say, you know, let's do this. And there it is, ten, three million people all. And they're all standing there, and they're waiting. And it's, it's not just man, man, man. It's man, woman, woman, man, all, and they're all, around the Kaaba on all levels, you know, two, three, and there's even a fourth level that doesn't go quite around all the Kaaba, or it didn't when I was there, and everyone is praying. It's so. majestic. It's majestic to witness that. And yeah. to witness in Medina in particular, you're standing next to somebody. I had this fabulous conversation with five Turkish women. I don't speak one word of Turkish. They didn't speak any English, but through hand gestures and everything, we talked about our families and where we were from. And I loved that part of it. I really did. It was beautiful. That's, and that, 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 that's another, I don't know. I don't know if that's a post Hajj realization or I, I think it is. Well, my wife's an intercultural, so it wasn't as new for her, but to see all the different types of humanity there with one purpose to become closer to their creator it's, it's really, just yeah. amazing it's really amazing yeah. so the other takeaway for me and i alluded to it a little bit but um is um that that constant tension that i experience of spending time with allah and being in the dunya and getting my to-do list done constant tension and when you're on hajj that tension isn't there because you're there for one purpose and only one purpose. And to have that experience for two and a half weeks is such a gift. It's a huge gift that I can bring up when I'm experiencing that tension of to-do list or do some practices. To-do list or sit with my Lord. And I go back to my Hajj experience and realize this is the only thing that counts in my life. One, one more little thing that when I was circumambulating, I took a little break. I mean, it was nice getting close to the Kaaba, but there was an area, I don't know, five yards or less than that, that uh, I stopped and I realized in that moment that this was I was seeing everyone in the one and the one in everyone at that moment. It was like, I was really, you know, crying. And I was just like, it was just, I didn't think about it. I just, it just happened. And it was like, it was a so, gift. and it was gift. Yeah, true. So we never know what we're going to get ever. If everyone's uh, miracle is different, but everybody has their miracle. That's right. So any, anybody have any questions or we show pictures? What, 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 what's next? So what I think we should do, <laughs> I guess I'm in charge here. Um, if anybody who's here has questions to ask that will um, just let's do that. And then we can let folks for whom this is late go on their way. And anybody who can stay can stay for some pictures. Does that sound Perfect. reasonable? We're, we're OK. Here. All right. So, Walia, do you have a question? You waved at me. No. 
sorry. So beautiful and lovely. I have to I have to depart. So I was okay. just saying goodbye. Thank you Bye. very Bye. much. Bye. Thank you for coming. Thank you. We love it. So any questions? We wish you all the experience when Allah, when Allah makes it possible for you. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so anyone, this we're just going to go into pictures and I'm going to let the recording go so that these can all be on the recording, but we understand if anybody has to leave, we won't think anything of it. And so I am saying, go. I am saying my salams to everyone. And thank you for the gathering thank of us you, all you together here. Comments. Thank you for being with us tonight. It you, was lovely to hear your contribution. Thank you, you, you so really, much. You really enriched the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you a lot to Jami for gathering us all together here at this yeah. blessed moment. So and thank you. For this coming. is the month of Hajj. So the yeah. special blessings too. Yeah. So we know that. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Okay. Here's the tent city in Minna. This is the famous tent city in Minna. And I hope I get these to <laughs> we were playing with this earlier. How do I get them to advance? I apologize. Uh, normally, I uh, think you dragged it before. I was using my mouse, wasn't I? Did I drag it? Let's see. Oh, I apologize. There, there it you is. go. There's my husband. And that is behind us The um, where the Kaaba is. This is big clock tower. That's a hotel. There is um, that's, that's the Sa'i. Right. Where you do the uh, Safa Mawa uh, back and forth. Notice most people are barefoot. Um, you can wear shoes, but I was criticized when I brought my Crocs in. They have to be clean, of course, but you are permitted to. But some people told me, oh, no, I take those shoes off. So, so this, is, this is looking from Safa towards Mawa, and the, the, the crowd that you see is coming back from Mawa to Safa. If you thought it was outside in the desert between two hills, I know yeah. I did too. It's actually an air conditioned building. Yeah. And yeah. This is Saudi Arabia. There's Zamzam Zam, there's Zam Zam stations <laughs> along the way over on the right side there. You see the Zamzam yeah. Zam station. This is not quite the experience that Hagar had. <laughs> <laughs> there's the Kaaba. We're on the second level. So we're above. Um, as you can see how many people there are going around it on the other level. And there's the other twisted picture for some reason. <laughs> That's also in the Kaaba, just to give you an idea. So you can rest here along the sides, uh, as you can see under the arches. Some, some people pray, down. yeah. People sleep there. I mean, you see everything, you see everything. Because people will go and camp out. There's your little Sufi. That's a manager's dress, actually, that she lent me. By the way, here's another miracle story is I, I, I spent hours researching what do I wear, what do I take? And um, people who had been on, on Hajj before uh, helped me with that. But also, a lot of people gave me clothes, just out of the blue. And my wife got in a lot of trouble when a couple of hairs creeped out from underneath her, her scarf. These are my roommates on the right. Uh, I'm of me. Uh, my left side actually is um, um, Rauda uh, from Buenos Aires. You might know her. And then there's uh, what's her? Amina Arnoff is on my right side. And the woman who is in uh, the burqa is actually from California. And she would not come down and eat with us. She would bring her food back to the room so she didn't have to uncover her face. She had already done Hajj, so she was there to, she told me, complete her Hajj. She had to do some things to complete it. I don't know what. Um, but I asked her why she covered like that, and she said, it's for my own protection. There you go. Sorry, that's <laughs> a little video that's, uh, I don't know, that video play in that stuff. Sideways, excuse me. There's that clock tire tower again. There's a hotel in that building. Yeah. 
the tail there. There's some of the buses. As you can see, people ride on top of the buses. They, they hitch a ride wherever they can. You see somebody in a wheelchair there. So you just see everything. It's just incredible, unbelievable. Here's David again. That's the same picture. There I am, the cobble behind me. Probably thinking about where's my next Kleenex. <laughs> David looks like he has a nose ring. He does not. That's just the picture. <laughs> oh, that's Medina. Medina. This so, could I ask a question first, David? I don't. I don't see you in your sheet. Oh yeah, this is past. Sheet well, this time. was this was after this was once once you complete um, all the steps. All the steps. Ah. Okay. There's, there's certain there's certain periods you you have. Uh, we talked about going into Ihram when you were coming into Mecca, and then you can go out for a couple of days. But then when you go to go to Arafat, you got to go back in. So there's you're in and out. So these pictures were taken. I think the whole time it's only like about four days that you were. Okay. Roughly. Thank you. Huh? There's Medina. This. Fabulous. And, and by the way, I don't know if I have a picture of it or not, but there are tents that open up so that when the heat of the day, they're like umbrella, huge umbrellas, huge umbrellas. And the prayer part of the, let's see if I have a, oh, there it is at night. Um, if you look in the foreground where you see tiny little bodies there, during the, those people are praying. During the day, in the heat of the day, they have umbrellas that cover you and protect you from the sun. It is absolutely amazing from an engineering feat. You see how large that is? Really? That is the Prophet's and, mosque. And the, and the Rauda where the Prophet lived is kind of in the middle of that. <laughs> it's, all of that's been built, 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 up, built up around where he lived and taught. There's, there are the umbrellas. the umbrellas. Those are the umbrellas. I was absolutely just fascinated by those <laughs> engineering feet. And prayer rugs down for, you know, Medina was really comfortable. There was so much beauty there. So they start with the Jamal. <laughs> and then they take you to Mecca, which is a little challenging. Those are, those are from the internet. I think I took those. There are the umbrellas up. Sorry for the quality of these photos. I was not, uh, not a great. And also they're blown up here. So there, there, there's the Kaaba at the ground level. And there's from one of the levels, probably the third level, second yeah. or third level. I think, think there's a few people there. <laughs> you wonder why my wife was not comfortable. <laughs> so there's good. On, on the left side, so the, the black stone is, you see the, the door there? The black stone is just down to the left. Bottom left corner. Bottom left corner. And the, the Yamani corner is, is the other corner that you see there where I, where I told you I got close enough to touch the cover. And when you circumambulate, you have to stop at that corner and do two rakat every time. Isn't two rakat? You do? Uh, no, you do, you do two rakat afterwards. At, there's a uh, Ibrahim place. Right, the Ibrahim corner. But, it, but if it's too crowded, you can do two rakats anywhere. <laughs> so uh, the other thing that's interesting about the Kaaba, you don't see it that well here, but this is, this is a black material on the outside. The whole thing is covered in material. And there is calligraphy in the, if you see the golden band around it, that's calligraphy. And there are special people who specialize in doing that sacred calligraphy passages from the Quran. I think this yeah. is, I think this is the Ibrahim thing. Oh, maybe, yeah. There it is. That was to remind me what year we went. <laughs> There's the tent city with all the air conditioners. <laughs> My brother is an HVAC um, engineer. 
And so he's worked for, you know, air conditioning companies and heating companies all his life, you know? And so I sent this to him. <laughs> I said, what do you think about these air conditioners? And he said, whoa, <laughs> whoa. He said, that's a lot of air conditioners, <laughs> a lot of tents. There is where you throw the stones at the Shaitan. Those are the big pillars we talked about. And you see the men in their ikram. They're all wearing their white um, sheets, I like to tell, call them. And there's the size of uh, one of the pillars. There are like three of them about that size. Needless to say, the, the size of the pillars has expanded over the years as the crowds grew and grew and grew and grew. They, they weren't always this big. Yeah, I think we're at the end. And I again, I apologize because these photos have kind of blown up. Uh, they are not very clear, but um, that that's kind of the Hajj experience. So it started out, uh, let me just see if there were some at the beginning that we missed. That's my favorite, Medina. Just so incredible. Such a beautiful place. Breathtakingly beautiful. I thought your favorite was pictures of that guy in his black shirt. <laughs> when I when I wasn't in Ikram, I was wearing my Aspen Hill Club tennis shirt. People would you you when you were there, you react you realize how Islam is not a Middle Eastern religion. It is an Asian religion. Yeah. Mainly Asian, because the most the most populated Muslim countries are Indonesia and Malaysia, and that's where you and then Turkey after that, and some of the stands like Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, etc. And those where you, you see more people from those countries than you do from like Egypt or you know Iran or what we you normally think of as being Islamic Middle Eastern countries, well, and so when. When we were circumambulating, people on more than one occasion, you know, they thought I was Turkish. I could pass for anything. But they thought David was Australian very often because it didn't occur to them that somebody could come from the United States. This is another mosque that was uh, set up by the, by the prophet. I think this is a different one, isn't it? This one, yeah. Kuba mosque. Yeah, it's the Kuba Mosque. I think this might have been the mosque where they changed the, whether you pray toward the Kaaba or not. Rather than Jerusalem. Yeah. Could have been, yeah. I, I, yeah. So. Oh, you know, there. There were there were some, but there weren't a whole lot of people that looked like us. <laughs> no, they couldn't they couldn't figure out where we were from, and rarely did they guess American. I, I, I was either Australian or somebody thought I was Turkish also. But it, it was a it was a mosaic of all the races and you know all kind all kinds of diversity, which is again, the inner is a, a great reminder that Allah created us in tribes to know one another. And we're standing and we're, right next to them, you know, we're touching them, we're standing right next to and them. We, it's, we are it's all really breathtaking. We are all in this to walk closer to our Lord. Thank okay. you for inviting us, Rahima. Well, thank you so much for what you've given us. This is such a gift. And I think it really sets us up well for the Ibrahim Salima Kamala workshop on the Hajj. And I'm going to tell one more fast story on myself that has to do with the Hajj. So here I am in Egypt working for this lady who's, you know, been on Hajj and Umrah and all of that. And they said to me, do you want to come over? We're having Eid for the Hajj because I was there in the month of the Hajj. And I'm like, yeah. And they said, well, you know, get here like before nine. You need to get here before nine. 
So I get there before nine and they've just strung up the goat that they had slaughtered in their backyard and they were bleeding it into the, you know, they took, they took the cap off the um, sewer line and they were bleeding it into that, right? And so, <laughs> you know, here's this goat. And I'm like, oh, and then they hung it up so it could drain and skinned it. And then my job was to carry up the pieces of meat that they were cutting off upstairs, cut them into the right size pieces, wrap them in paper. And then a little bit later in the day, we would hold them out over the balcony and give them to people coming by. Okay. okay. So I was up and down the stairs, up and down the stairs, carrying this warm flesh <laughs> from the goat that had just, lamb actually. Um, yeah, it was a lamb. There they can slaughter them up to one year. And so it was a lamb. And that was, you know, so when in our Tarika, when we talk about sacrifice, I mean, I don't think money. My <laughs> husband now, he says, so how many goats do we need to give? You know? <laughs> I mean, it's sort of like, you know, having that tangible experience yeah. of slaughtering it, wrapping it up, putting it on string, and then just have people row yeah. after row after row that you're handing it out to. Wow. And so that was my first um, exposure to Hodge from the, you know, back end. Yeah. And yeah. then sort of working into it. But it was. Back end feet first. Yeah. But it was very whole. I mean, when they were doing it, it was clearly holy. And I mean, they were just, you know, they were in the blood and the guts and all of that stuff. Sure. And it was sure. totally holy. And it was totally clear. Yeah. How holy that act was for them. Yeah. And that, you know, washed off on me. So we, we didn't, we didn't, thank you for mentioning that because we, we failed to mention it, but that's, that's another part of the ritual is that you sacrifice a sheep. Yeah. As part of Hajj. Um, the tour, the tour group, you know, you, we don't do it personally, but the, uh, the tour group did. Yeah. Tour group, uh, does they it, tell you, does they it tell in your name. When it's done. Yeah, they tell you when it's does, done. Does it in your name. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if you're in Cairo at the time of either Eid, you have to be careful on the freeways because they're herding the sheep, sheep, the lambs, wrong way up on and off ramps. So you're driving on the freeway. At least this was in the 90s. Wow. You're on the freeway driving around the sheep being herded to be sacrificed for the Eid. So wow. yeah. it makes... Um, when you think of the number of people in Cairo, you can think of the number of sheep that are being herded around the city. So it's sort of a remarkable experience. So that yeah. was not quite like the cub, but there's some similarity to I what's going so. on. I think so, it sounds like it. It does <laughs> sound like it, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. Well, if there are no other questions, we'll let Sama and Nu go because it's very late where they are and <laughs> Well, we just thank, I'm going to stop the recording now.